Hello, I'm Helen Stone, and I'm going to tell you about the organization I represent, Generation to Generation. The pandemic has forced us to change and review the way in which we lead our day-to-day -day lives. Only a couple of weeks ago, Chief Rabbi Ephraim Mervis asked us to think about new and different ways in which we might practice and celebrate our Judaism. This need for change and adaptation applies equally in the area of Holocaust education. Coronavirus has forced us to find new and technically sophisticated methods of communication. But the main driving force that has compelled us to create generation to generation is time itself. The organization came into being as a fully fledged charity just three and a half years ago in response to our growing awareness of the passing of time. We looked at our parents who'd survived the Holocaust and knew that unless we did something very quickly, their stories would disappear with their demise. This knowledge is what has driven us to create generation to generation, otherwise known as G to G. So you may ask, why do we need yet another charity for Holocaust education? There seem to be plenty already. Well, we're unique because we focus exclusively on training and preparing the children and grandchildren of survivors to tell their family stories. In the past six months, we've grown at an amazing rate. And our initial cohort of five speakers has now increased to 18 and is continuing to grow. We are driven by a great sense of urgency. There is little time left now for us to hear first-hand accounts of what Holocaust survivors experienced and how they managed to survive. We need to add to this store of memories, complementing them with stories that have not yet been told. Who better to do this than the descendants of those survivors? We feel a weight of responsibility to ensure that these important stories are preserved for future generations. They can teach us so much about prejudice, cruelty, and the dangers of a totalitarian state but also about courage and resilience in the face of unimaginable horror. They are also an important tool for combating Holocaust denial. So who are our target audience? Our prime target is young people in secondary schools, especially those in years nine and 10, age 13 to 15, who will be studying World War II as part of their history curriculum. In addition, we present to a wide range of civic, religious, communal, and higher education organizations. A survivor giving a first-hand account has immense authenticity. We don't offer them that, but we can create something else almost as powerful by using all the tools at our disposal recorded testimony in both sound and video, old photos of people and places, film, artifacts, diaries, letters, documents, newspaper articles, and much more. Using multimedia, we've been able to create presentations that are fully engaging for young people who don't always have a very long attention span. We weave together moving personal stories and historical facts. This is not just a history lesson, but the tale of an individual caught up in one of the most terrible periods of persecution in living memory. We aim to arouse the emotions of our listeners and create empathy and understanding of what it means to be seen as other and to be the subject of discrimination and prejudice. 
we make sure that we refer not only to Jews, but also to other groups who've suffered similarly. We don't simply launch our presenters into speaking without first doing a huge amount of preparation. Each presenter is allocated a mentor and we offer extensive training in all areas, presentation and research skills, how to adapt your talk to different audiences, how to present on Zoom, and how to deal with the effect of this work on us, the presenters. I'm now going to introduce you to one of our newer presenters, Jeanette Marks, who will tell the story of her mother, Masha Nachmanson, born Stern. I was actually Jeanette's mentor and supported her during the compilation of this gripping and moving account of her mother's experiences. I'm very proud of what she has produced and G2G have already received feedback from school audiences describing the profound impact of her presentation. Now I invite all of you to hear her very personal story. Hello everybody. And thank you for coming to listening to my mother's story. My mother survived against the odds. She survived the atrocities that Hitler and his Nazi supporters with collaborators perpetrated on Jews and many other minorities. My mother survived because she was rescued and arrived in Malmo, Sweden on the 28th of April 1945. The clip you see here, the film reel you see here, is taken from a film, Every Face Has a Name. The film was put together by using archives taken, film taken during the few days when Sweden accepted some survivors, Holocaust survivors, together with bringing back Scandinavian prisoners of war. And this is my mother, Masha Nachmanson, born Stern. She was born on the 30th of December, 1920, in Lodz, Poland. My mother was born into a Hasidic family and she was number eight of 12 children. My grandfather Yitzhak was a rabbi and they were very poor, but it was a family where my mother grew up with love, respect for one another and a great sense of responsibility for one another's well-being. She was also a bit of a rebel. She was hoping to one day go to university, study philosophy and literature. For that, she needed to go into a slightly less orthodox senior school. She got a scholarship into such a school, but it wasn't enough to pay for everything. And because she was a good student, she was able to supplement the fees by giving private tuition to girls in her own class who were struggling. Lodge was a city pre-war of approximately 750,000 inhabitants, of which 250 were Jews. Every third person was Jewish. 250,000 Jews is approximately the number of Jews in the UK today. Eastern Europe had a lot of rampant anti-Semitism pre-war. But once the Nazis invaded Poland on the 1st of September, 1939, and the Polish army capitulated within a week, the anti-Semitism became much worse. Here you see Nazis encouraging the locals to humiliate two Orthodox Jews. A lot of Locals were quite happy to do that, to support the Nazis, but not everyone. In the very beginning of the Nazi occupation, they introduced anti-Jewish laws. Some examples, marriage and sexual relations between Jews and non-Jews were forbidden. 
Jude had to obtain by and wear a yellow star so that they would easily be recognised. They were dismissed from their jobs purely for being Jewish. They were also forbidden to take any pleasures in parks, restaurants or swimming pools. And they were not allowed to own any valuables. In my mother's case, apart from books, the most valuable items they had was a sewing machine. You will be hearing my mother speak in various clips from now on, and you will hear her speak in Swedish because Sweden became her home. Min brorson var bara 15 år gammal. Kallades dit. De påstod att pappan hade igen pengar, vilket var lögn. Vi hade inga pengar. Inga pengar att gömma. Han blev så illa misshandlad. Så när de till slut kom upptäckte att de hade tagit hit en fel person. Och då kastade de ut honom på betongplattan. Vi kände knappt igen pojken. There wasn't a moment when the Jews did not fear that these clips were taken in 1995, when my mother was nearly 75 years old. The Nazis also created and built ghettos in the countries where they occupy, which they occupied. In Lodz, the area the Nazis chose to build the ghetto was the industrial area, Baluti. Now, Lodge had a huge textile industry. So Baluti had loads of factories and the accommodation was primitive. In this small area, the Nazis squeezed in 160,000 Jews and other minorities too. They managed to do that all in one month by sheer intimidation and threats. As I said, the Jews were not the only ones persecuted. In the area, in ghetto, there were some Romans, gypsies, and there were people with different political views, people belonging to the socialist parties. But today, I'm going to tell you about my mother's story. The area had a main road going through it, which was an important road to transport the, the German, German military machinery. And therefore, the ghetto was divided into two parts, and each part was sealed with fences and guarded by the Gestapo, the Nazi police, and later on by Jewish ghetto police. And because of the two parts, there were bridge, a bridge connecting the two parts so that Jews could cross to work. This is just a picture a bill of one of the buildings in that ghetto area. It's a modern photograph, but just to show you that in those apartments, which in those days had very few, if any, had electricity, and the toilets were often in the courtyard. And in these apartments, because of the overcrowding, the families had to often share one apartment with seven, eight or so people in one room. The Nazis commanded the Jews to create their own administration. It was called the Judenrat. The head of the ghetto, the Lodge ghetto administration, was Chaim Rumkowski. He became quite a controversial figure later on. He chose people he, he felt he could work with. This Judenrat, the administration, was responsible for the day-to-day -day running. They created schools to make life as normal as possible. They printed money, ghetto money, which was actually only useful within the ghetto. They printed food tokens. They made, created their own Jewish police to 
keep some order amongst the 160,000 people. And they all even had their own courts. Chaim Rukowski had to, almost every day, negotiate with Hans Bibov, who you see here on the right, because Hans Bibov was the real ruler of the ghetto. He was a Nazi administrator and he was ruthless and corrupt. My mother, who was now about 20 years old, her first job in the ghetto was as an assistant to one of the judges. This photograph is actually from the court where my mother worked. But her job did not last long because Hans Bibov passed down a command to the judges that they had to pass the death penalty on a young man who had stolen a small piece of bread to feed his starving family. The judges could not bring themselves to do that. They preferred to go underground, which meant my mother's job came to an end. But she was lucky. Being a textile industry, there were many laundries in G Baluti, in the ghetto. My mother got a job in one of the laundry's office, offices. This photograph is from that office and it is the only treasured photograph that I have of my mother of that time. And I don't have any photographs of any of my murdered relatives. My mother made some wonderful lifelong friends in this place where she worked until the end of the ghetto time. Conditions in the ghetto were dire. Overcrowding, as you can see here on the left. On the right, people resorted to selling any items they had managed to bring with them into the ghetto from their homes in the rush of having to leave the home. Those who didn't have a job had to resort to selling these few items to get some money to buy food. So starvation was spreading, soup kitchens were formed, diseases were spread, spreading, mainly tuberculosis and typhus. People were so desperate, so hungry that they potato, carrot, anything to help feed the family. Ton hundra thirty four Boen Mike Tal Winter. For at få en chance at få ut nothing. Direct Aldrig till alla. Ofta kom SS med lastbilar på natten. Plockade ut folk från köerna och körde i väg med dem direkt till gaskamrar. Men dagen efter på natten gick folk ut igen. Värre hungers känslan var mycket starkare än rädslan. Det gällde att överleva. Det var en kamp om livet med alla medel. Man ville tro att kriget tar slut. Att fienden inte hinner utrota oss alla. Livsinstinkten är stark. Viljan att leva starkast när utsikt 
utsikten för att överleva är minimal. Also <coughs> that winter, January 1942, the Wannsee Conference took place just outside Berlin, the infamous Wannsee Conference. At that conference, the top Nazi officers met to discuss what was to become known as the final solution of the Jewish problem. Because for the Nazis, the problem was the Jews were not dying fast enough or in large enough numbers. So they decided to create a list of all the people who they considered useless to the German, the Nazi war effort. Min bror hade kommit på listan. Samma bror som blev misshandlat hos Gestapo. Han hade varit mycket sjuk. Han hade legat i sängen i vid två månader. Kroppen var svullen av hunger fylld med vatten. Med stor uppoffring från vår sida, vi avstod och våra ransoner och fick honom på benen. Och vi bestämde att inte låta honom fångas. När polisen kom på natten för att hämta honom och han inte fanns hemma, tog de mig som islam. My mother sat in prison for three weeks and every time the cell door opened she thought her end was here. The people on the list, there were two ways of murdering them. Some were taken outside cities into open areas or woodland where they had to dig their own graves, trenches, stand in front of those, on top of those trenches, and they were shot. The other method was by collecting people and transporting them to concentration camps, where the first concentration camp to have the gas chamber was Chelno. Chelno is the place where one of my aunts, Hana, was taken to, where she was murdered. During this cold winter, January, both my grandparents, Yitzhak and Yenta, died from tuberculosis and typhus, as did one aunt, Yafa, and her husband. They both died from the same diseases, they had two little boys, Shimele and Yankele, Simon and Jacob. They were six and nine years old, and they were now being looked after in the orphanage, lodge orphanage. And when rumors started circulating that these orphanages and the hospitals were going to be cleared because they were no good to the Nazi war effort, my mother took it on herself to defy the curfew, which was every night in the lodge ghetto, deciding to go to the orphanage and try and rescue her two nephews to try and hide them, like they managed to hide my uncle. Ner, you come from Tilhemet, sprang alla barn imot mig. Held mig fast. Alla ville de följa med mig hem. Barnen var rädda. De anade en fara. Men när jag bor föreståndaren om lov att ta med mig min systers son fick jag ett bestämt 
Nej. Barnen var räknade och han var ansvarig för deras antal. Det hjälpte ingenting, inga argument, inga tårar, mina och barnens. Jag fick gå därifrån ensam. Lämna barnen övergivna. Ledsna, rädda. Det var barnens sista timmar i livet. Tidigt i gryningen skedde last. Lastbilar fram lastade på barnen, personalen och kördes direkt till gaskamrarna. This image never left my mother. But life carried on. The Soviet army was now making headways, progress towards Warsaw. And my mother recalled that they thought they could even hear sometimes the thuds from artillery fighting. And that gave them some hope. Maybe they could be rescued soon. More random killings, more drills, just to weaken their res the Jews res Jewish resolve, resolve to survive. But rescue did not come. Instead, the Nazis decided <coughs> excuse me, to liquidate, to close down the ghetto. The, it started on June the 23rd and carried a, a small package because they were going to be resettled. During the ghetto's existence, 210,000 people passed through the ghetto and only between seven and 10,000 people survived. My mother was one of them. So the people leaving the ghetto were marched to Radergast station, which was just outside Lodge in a suburb called Marisin. There, this is what they saw, cattle wagons. They were pushed and told to get into these cattle wagons and they were pushed in so tightly that there was only standing room with a small bucket in a corner to relieve yourself if you could get to that corner. It was summer. My mother left the ghetto on the 16th of August, the height of the summer. They had no water or food with them. The conditions standing in those cattle wagons until the whole train was filled were difficult. But eventually the train left and the following dawn, my mother arrived in Auschwitz. And as soon as the train came to a standstill, they were greeted by shouts of Schnell and Raus, get out quickly. The doors were unbolted and people fell out virtually. Some had even died on that journey. And as soon as everybody was out, the selection started. Boys and men to one side, women to the other side, but there was a third selection. And that was with mothers with young children or old people or people who obviously seemed to have some sort of disability. These people on these photographs were marched straight 
to the gas chambers. My mother and her siblings were marched to the barracks. My mother's barrack was number 25. The photograph here is just a generic photograph from Auschwitz barrack. And once inside the barracks, they were commanded to undress. They had the hair, body hair shaved off and they were painted in some sort of paraffin to try and clean them. After having your hair cut off, shaved off, paraffin is pretty hurt, pretty painful. And all this was done under the gaze and command of the capos. Capos were themselves prisoners, but they had arrived in Auschwitz long before my mother, and they had become so dehumanized by their stay there, that they were capable of inflicting horrendous emotional and physical pain on their fellow Jews. Utdelningen av denna soppa är den mest förnedrande jag kan få se i mitt liv. Fångarna slängde sig över kitten, slogs mot varandra, klöste varandra så blodet rann, trampade på varandras fötter. Allt för att utkämpa en plats så nära kitten som möjligt. För att kunna sätta händerna i den och ta upp lite av den otrovärda soppan. Till denna soppa kunde verkligen avgöra av vem som skulle bli nästa hungersoffer. There was also the infamous Dr. Mengele in Auschwitz. He had totally abandoned the Hippocratic Oath. On the right, you see one of his victims. If you survived Mengele's difficult treatments and experiments, you were lucky. The lady on the right survived. The photograph, however, is taken from the Nuremberg trials. These were the trials um, where the Nazi perpetrators had to face their punishment. But sadly, Mengele escaped and never got the punishment he so deserved. Auschwitz was a hell of a thing on Earth. One Dante's inferno. Men som tog sig från all hennes värdighet tvingades ner på marken, tvingades krypa under fötterna på mördare. Om välda av hotets mörker. Vi lå på nokna brytsar åtta på en så tätt så trångt att när vi ville vända på oss fick man vänta tills den som låg närmast också gjorde det. På natten väcktes man för att ta sig ut på en appellplats. The Nazis played Russian roulette with the prisoners when they were on these parades. They would choose every tenth person and shoot them. Or if anybody couldn't stand up because from sheer exhaustion and starvation, 
that person would be dragged out and shot. My mother, however, considers herself incredibly lucky because she was only in Auschwitz four weeks. Because one day, her barracks and another barrack and a few others on the men's side too, were told to go and, and assemble in front of the gas chambers. They thought, she thought, her end was here, that she would be gassed with everybody else. And they were standing, waiting, with no instructions. Eventually, they were told to go into a room and pick out a dress, a pair of underwear, and a pair of shoes. They knew who those clothes had once belonged to. But they were lucky because they were now dressing into normal clothes and they were going to be shipped, taken away from Auschwitz. My mother had been chosen to go and work as a slave laborer in Berlin, just a suburb of Neukölln, where there is a Krupp, Krupp, Krupp ammunition factory. And when they arrived at that factory, they were in such a state that the manager of the factory, who employed mostly German civilians, but also some non-Jewish prisoners of war, he took one look at the new arrivals and decided they were too sick to mix with the other workforce. So he put them in quarantine, where they were given one meal a day and they rested. My mother thought she had arrived in heaven. But after about two weeks, they were called back to work. The work was difficult, but mostly because Berlin by that time and Germany, by that time, the end of 1944, they were now, it was now being bombed by the Allies day and night. Whereas the workers and the non-Jewish prisoners were given an opportunity to hide in shelters, not so for the Jews. And they had to find anywhere they could hide when the bombs were falling. But eventually, again, the Nazis realized that maybe this group of people would be captured by their enemies, by the Allies or by the Russians and Soviets. And therefore, another removal move to another place was decided on. My mother was taken to Berlin station where they had to wait three days. A journey that would normally take a few hours took three days because the men were then taken to Sachsenhausen, which is a men's concentration camp, and the women to Ravensburg concentration camp, where my mother arrived at the beginning of 1945. On her arrival, she saw those who had managed to survive the atrocious conditions in this labor and concentration camp. They were now not many, and they were also starving, and they were in a terrible conditions. Diseases were rampant. Even medical experiments were taking place in Ravensburg too. Living conditions were very similar to Auschwitz. But by beginning of 1945, Red Cross food parcels were starting to arrive. Some arrived in Ravensburg. However, these food parcels were not particularly beneficial because they, con they contained high fat content in the food, chocolates, which the prisoners threw themselves over, butter and so on. And for somebody who is in starving and as thin as these women were, once they ate this food, they became even more ill with diarrhea and vomiting. So the stench was horrendous in their closed um, accommodation. But one day, they were told to get out into the path, which was in Ravensburg concentration camp. 
They walked along the path and they noticed that very few guards were still there. And they managed to get through the main gate. And on the other side, on the outside, they saw this long convoy of white buses. On top was painted Red Cross and on the side was written Sweden. My mum went up to who she thought was the driver. He had a uniform and she said to him in German, what is this? He reassured her that they were being rescued. And my mother's first word she learned in Swedish was tak, thank you. The white buses were there because of a negotiation that had been taking place for a few months between Count Bernadotte, who you see here on the left. He was the Swedish Red Cross, head of the Swedish Red Cross. He had tried to bring back home the Scandinavian prisoners of war because there were Scandinavian prisoners of war, Norwegians and Danish who had been occupied by the Nazis. He negotiated for their return and Himmler, one of Hitler's right-hand men, who you see here on the right, agreed if he was given cars and vans to escape with because he knew that they were losing the war and he did not want to be caught. On the last day of the negotiation, a Jew from Sweden who was representative of World Jewish Relief asked Bernadotte if he would be allowed to join in the negotiation. He was, and that is at that point that Himmler relented and allowed Jews to join in that, to be, to be joined in that rescue. And this is how my mother arrived in Malmö on the 28th of April, 1945, into her new home. Their clothes had to be incinerated. That's how bad everybody was. They were now examined by kind doctors who spoke to them in a gentle, empathetic way. Some were really desperately ill and they were put into hospitals. The others, like my mother, were taken to quarantine, where they had to stay until they were deemed safe to be let out into society. And my mother's first job after that, because she spoke no Swedish, was in the hospital kitchen. And you can see how she's eating herself back to health. And soon she started seeing uh, other groups of people. She met my, my dad, the most handsome man in Sweden, I think. They got married in February 1948, and I was born approximately a year later. And in 1950, my parents and I went on Aliyah. We moved to Israel where my mother was reunited with seven of her surviving siblings. And that is such a miracle. My sister Dahlia was born, she's sitting on my, on my dad's lap. And one of my mother's sisters is second from the right and my mother is second from the left. But eight years later, we moved back to Sweden in 1958. And my mother got a job as a teacher in the Jewish nursery school. She taught Jewish traditions, laws, and history to the little ones and also to older children in the Sunday classes. She loved that job where she could connect with children again. But she never forgot the promise she had made herself when she left Germany that she would make a promise to the people who were murdered, never to forget them and tell the story to others. And every opportunity she had, she stood up and told the story because she wanted to give dignity to those who had no descendants so that their murder would not be forgotten. <laughs> 
And every time we went back to Israel to visit family, we went to Jerusalem to the Holocaust Museum, where there is a children's memorial. My mother always lingered for several minutes, shedding tears because she could not get over the pain she felt when she couldn't rescue her two beautiful nephews. One and a half million children were murdered. Europe had 11 million Jews pre-war. Hitler succeeded in murdering 6 million of them, but not only Jews. There's a list, Romas, people with disabilities, Jehovah's Witness, homosexuals, and so on and so on. My departed family, my murdered family, these are the names that I know of. There were many more. My grandparents both came, Yenta and, Yit and Yitzhak, both came from large families. But my mother tried to protect Dalia, my sister and myself, from the horrors of the Holocaust. So I don't have any more names, but they are all in my heart. But my mother had a happy ending. She married, she had two daughters, we have families, and my mother was privileged to get to know some of her grandchildren. My mother was very wise and incredibly tolerant, considering of the intolerance that she had suffered through her lifetime. She passed down to myself and my sister the words, you have to know where you come from, to know who you are today, and therefore also know where you are going and pass down the values that you have been taught. But her dearest wish was that future generations should learn from the awful experiences that she and millions of others suffered in those dark times and never forget that education, tolerance and love are the foundations on which we can all try to overcome racism and intolerance. But sadly, the world has not learned. There have been many more genocides. And now, how the Chinese are treating the Uyghur Muslims, it is a shame on humanity. And what would my mother's message be today on Yom HaShoah? I believe she would say, continue telling my story, the survivors and the, and the murdered people's stories. Continue telling it from generation to generation, like we do with the Pesach story. And let all of us be the torch bearers, the torch that would shine light, the light of dignity, respect and tolerance to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Jeanette's moving account of her mother's experience exemplifies the stories that we at G2G are seeking, uncovering, and bringing into the public sphere. There are many more still untold. We have seen for ourselves how powerful their effect can be, especially on younger listeners who are motivated to reflect upon the injustices of the past and think about how they might live their lives in the future. The future is key to our identity as an organization. Jeanette is a member of the second generation, but now we're looking to the third generation to continue our work. Many survivors find it very difficult to speak to their children about their traumatic earlier lives and are silent for years. Often, however, they can more easily talk to their grandchildren 
with whom they may have an equally close but essentially different relationship. We are now recruiting those grandchildren, known to us as 3Gs, as G to G presenters. And our very first 3G speaker, Avital Menachem, became a fully qualified presenter just weeks ago. We were hoping to feature her in this program, but she has very inconsiderately just given birth to a baby girl and has other priorities at present. Currently, we have three more 3Gs in training and have just signed up a further four young people. All of them have committed themselves to the challenging but ultimately rewarding task of preserving for posterity the treasured memories of their grandparents. You will now hear from two of these young people, Jacqueline Luck and Dahlia Wittenberg. They are being interviewed by Katie Palmer, who leads the third generation group on our committee. They discuss how they see their role in Holocaust education. What made you want to tell your grandparents' story? A few years ago, I took a trip with my brothers and my dad to go and discover where my grandparents came from in Poland. Um, and in doing that journey, I really connected with my grandparents' story uh, and learned a lot about it and, and just became really um, excited at the idea of understanding where they came from. And when I returned, I started telling people some of the story. And I think people connected with the fact that I was talking about my grandparents and started thinking about the, the history of their own grandparents. Um, and I just felt a real sense that of responsibility that it was for me to pass on the story of my grandparents because nobody else will and I think unless you experience it and, and feel their story um, and understand it then it's harder to pass it on so that, that was in a nutshell why I wanted to tell my grandparents story and, and it, it's a remarkable story of survival and resilience and one that I take a lot of comfort from and inspiration from. I think I feel a, a, a great responsibility to tell my grandmother's story. Um, when she, I, I mean, after, after she came out of Auschwitz and eventually uh, ended up in London, she told uh, her cousins who were living here um, about what had happened to her and they thought she was mad. So she stopped telling the story and it wasn't until the Nuremberg trial that people came to her and said, oh, I'm so sorry. I." Um, we thought we thought you were crazy. We didn't realise that this actually happened to you. Um, and si since then, she hasn't really talked apart from uh, to cameras. And I feel that it's really important um, that we, as the subsequent generations, tell the story, especially in the face of um, rising anti-Semitism um, and, uh, and 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 ju ju just sort of lack of education about it um and you know all the rubbish on social media about it as well i think it requires uh people in our generation to stand up and say actually this this happened to my grandmother or my grandfather um so i i, I i've all, i've always seen that as my my responsibility to do that um, would you recommend other third generations to become involved with um with g to g I would absolutely recommend for anyone that's a third generation of a Holocaust survivor to get involved with G2G. I think firstly it's so important that the grandchildren of survivors are equipped to tell their grandparents stories and make sure that they are not forgotten um, and doing so as part of an organisation like G2G I think is a really safe way of doing that and it, it's a way of reaching out to as many people that can benefit from listening to those stories as possible. But also I think having the support to, um, to put your story in a, in a way that is really um, easy for people to understand and, and, and more than that, just if people are able to learn about the story as part of the history, um, it's really valuable. And from a personal perspective, I feel like it's given me a greater depth of understanding of my grandparents' story. Um, and once I'm completed the process of putting together my presentation um, I feel like my my family will have a 
an amazing keepsake as well and and we'll all be able to benefit from being able to recount our grandparents story of survival i would definitely recommend anybody um who has uh, grandparents great grandparents um, who are holocaust survivors to tell to tell the story and to tell it again and again and again um because as as a teacher it's all very well learning something in a history book but when you've got somebody there saying my aunt was you know was murdered as a child because she was jewish it becomes a lot more real for them not just for kids but for adults as well and i i think there's so much value in um in having that real personal connection to the story um yes i would a absolutely and any anybody who has um who has ancestry uh, should definitely tell their story and g2g is, is a great organization to, to to do it with because it's so supportive i'm sure that you like me were struck by the honesty dedication and commitment of both Jacqueline and Dahlia. Our aim today has been to inform you about our work and to reassure you that we will make every effort to promote the continuation of Holocaust testimony so that every Yom HaShoah and throughout the year, there will be members of the second, third and fourth generations able to tell their family stories. We want to safeguard the continuity of Holocaust education. You may have a family member who was caught up in the Holocaust and would like to become one of our presenters. We're especially keen for the grandchildren of survivors to get involved. We already have a number of third generation presenters in training. You've just heard two of them, but would really like more. Or you might want to offer your specific skills and join our administration team as a volunteer. You can find out much more about us on our website, www.generation2generation.org.uk. That's generation to generation with a number two in the middle. I began my introduction with a reference to our current chief rabbi. I'd like to end with two quotations from the late chief rabbi, Lord Dr. Jonathan Sachs, who included these words on Radio 4's Thought for the Day. He told us, it's the people not like us who make us grow. Rabbi Sachs emphasizes here the need for us to reach out and learn from each other. And his final words? Memory can't change the past, but it can help us to have the courage to change the future. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>